Welcome back to Logic 101. I'm William Spaniel, and we are finally getting to the meat of our course. This lecture is our introduction to proofs, and we'll be working with proofs for the next couple dozen lectures or so. Now, you've seen proofs before. Something like this should look somewhat familiar. We just haven't been particularly rigorous with what we're doing, which I'm now going to be introducing to you. So here we have four different premises. On line one, we see S implies R. On line two, we see not S implies not W. On line three, we have W or D. And on line four, we have not R. And then at the end of those premises, we see those three dots, meaning we want to ultimately conclude that D is true. So in a proof, we take premises, things that we assume are true, and what we want to do with those is show that something else must be true as a consequence. So if lines one through four are all true, if we assume that all of those premises are true, what we want to be able to show is that D must be true as well. And actually, the rules of proofs are pretty simple. There are only three things that we need to be paying attention to as we go through this. One, we can use rules of replacement or rules of inference on any line above the current line. So we have a bunch of different lines that we have based off of premises or things that we've learned are true using rules of replacement or rules of inference on those premises. And we can continue using any line above what we are working on currently to show that more things are true based off of rules of replacement or rules of inference. This is why we spent so much time learning those rules of replacement and rules of inference because we're now implementing all of those things and we need to be very good about doing that as we go through these proofs. Why, uh, rule number two says that all lines must cite their reasoning. The purpose for this is that we want to make sure that we're correct in what we're doing, that we're actually right, that we're getting from point A to point B in a logically valid manner, and we want to make sure that our results are replicable. So someone should be able to pick up our proof later on and understand how we go from point A to point B to point C. They should be able to see, ah, yes, uh, he's doing this, okay, and then he's doing that, right, that's okay, and then after that he does this, okay, that's good, and so forth. It should be replicable in that manner, and if we're not citing our reasoning as we go through, well, we're interfering with the replication process. Lastly, the final line in a proof should be whatever it is that you're trying to prove. So if we go back to what we were looking at before, we see that we have therefore D there, which means the last line of our proof should say D is true, because if we have D is true, then the purpose of the proof is complete. All right, so now let's go ahead and try implementing these rules. Let's start off by looking at the fact that we have not R on line four. So premise four says not R is true. That's something that we're assuming is true. And on line one, we see that we have another R there. We have S implies R. And we know that if we have the negation of a consequent in an implication, then we can get the negation of the antecedent. So if we use lines one and four and apply modus tollens to those lines, we can derive something new. We know namely that not S is true. True. Correct? So lines one and four jointly imply that not S is true via modus tollens. So we have derived something new, something that we did not have originally in the premises, but we still don't have a conclusion. We want to get that D is true based off of those premises, and that's fine that we're not there yet. It's actually going to be useful that we've derived something else is logically following from those premises because now we can use that line. So we're done with line five. Now we can use any line one through five to come up with something else that is true, something else that follows from what we already know. And if we see that we have not S on this line five, and you go back to line two, we have not S implies not W. So we can apply modus ponens to those two lines. So if we take lines two and lines five, and we combine them together, and we use what we know about rules of inference based off of that, we can, we can conclude rather that not W is true as well. So again, we're just applying rules of replacement and rules of inference to lines above to derive new things. And you'll notice here that now we have something that interacts with a D. So if we look at line three, we have W or D. And on line six, what we just recently concluded, well, we have not W. And we know that if you have the negation of a part of a disjunction, you can apply disjunctive syllogism to get the other thing as being true. 
So we have line three and line six, and we apply disjunctive syllogism to those lines. We get something else. We get D, and lo and behold, we are done with the proof. We wanted to ultimately conclude that D is true, and using the rules of replacement and rules of inference that we've learned, we have gone through those lines, learned new things are true, and ultimately used those new things that we learned are true to conclude that D must be true as well if those four premises hold. So that is the first proof that we've done. And I want to be clear about something here. This is relatively easy to do in two different ways. One, and not the way I want to actually refer to this here, one, I made this proof very easy because this was the first proof that we've done. These logical proofs will be a little bit more difficult as we move forward because I, they should be challenging. Not everything should be so easy to prove. But on the other hand, going away from these logic proofs, this is not going to be so easy. If you start applying this sort of mathematical reasoning or logical reasoning to mathematics, things are going to be a little bit more difficult. And I just want to emphasize that, yes, logic is cool and logic is useful, but actually we're doing something that's relatively easy, all things considered. And the reason that this is so easy in comparison is that when we're doing these sorts of proofs in this course, you're going to have the premises and intended conclusion as a given. So I'm going to give you the premises, I'm going to give you what we're trying to conclude, and you will know all of those those things. When you're out doing proofs in the real world on your own, you often have to prove the individual premises. You might not know that P implies Q, so you might be spending a very long time showing that P implies Q, even though you don't really care so much about P implies Q, but you need to know that P implies Q in order to complete a larger proof. So you might be spending a lot of time just proving that single lines are true, even though you don't really care too much about those lines directly. Second, you don't always know what conclusion you want to reach. Here again, I said we want to show that D is true, but sometimes you have a bunch of different things that you believe are true as premises, and you're not actually sure what you want to ultimately conclude with them. So there's a bit of an art form in trying to figure out, okay, well, I have a bunch of things that I think are true. What else can I show is true as well? And then lastly, if you think you want to know or you think you know and think you believe that something is true and you want to go ahead and show that it's true, you might not actually be sure and be correct that the conclusion follows. So you might be unsure whether you have D or not D as being true, and you might start out by thinking, oh, I think not D is true given these premises, and you'll spend a lot of time trying to show that not D is true, and you might ultimately get nowhere because it doesn't actually follow. So again, in these proofs, we are doing things relatively easy. We're making life as simple as we can for ourselves here to introduce how logical proofs work. So premises are going to be given to you and what you're going to try to be concluding based off of those premises are going to be given to you as well. And that's going to make your life a little bit easier. All right, that's the introduction to proofs. And in the next bunch of lectures, we're going to be talking about various different proof strategies, which will help you out when you're getting yourself into a pickle. Hope you enjoy this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.